Uh, my name is Jonathan Brown. Welcome um, to our first, I don't know if this is the first talk of the whole so the, the academic year. Um, uh, Professor Andrew March from Yale University, political theory in the Department of Political Science, and uh, author of a very good book. I, I recommend it. I own it. It's one of the few books I, actually, I think you gave me a copy, but if you hadn't, I would have bought it. Islam and Liberal Citizenship, which is terrific one stop shopping for people who have questions about liberalism, uh, debates about how Islam, how everyone understands that, and liberalism, how everyone understands that, can be are reconciled or compatible. Also issues of you know, how different Muslim scholars in the West have come up with uh, different models for thinking about being Muslim in the West. It's a very useful book. He's also written uh, articles on uh, almost kind of every you know, hot topic, uh, whether <laughs> blasphemy or laws of war, freedom of expression, um, Muslims, can Muslims live in the West or live in non-Muslim countries? He has articles on these. Uh, and if you look at his uh, SSRN page, you can find these and you can download them. And I think they're, I mean, I use them all the time because they're so useful for, if you have questions on these issues, he, he does a great job of, of uh, laying out the problem and, and different solutions and then and analyzing them. So it's extremely, uh, it's a, it's a great guide. His, his works are a terrific guide for people who are interested in these topics, which of course lots of people are. Uh, I was uh, particularly interested, I, the reason I brought him, wanted to bring him to speak here at the very beginning of the semester is because my Islam in the West first summer, I wanted him to have the chance to hear from someone who's really an expert on uh, liberalism and uh, as the title is, as the title is Contemporary Fall Lines Conceptual following and contemporary liberalism. So uh, I hope that especially students in my class will feel uh, free to ask questions. I know you've only had one class. We haven't talked about this yet. But I'm sure you're, you're aware of some of the discussion uh, topics that will come up inevitably. So Andrew's going to speak to us, and then we'll have hopefully plenty of time for Q&A. Great. And if, if you want to be on the ACMCU mailing list and you're not already, you can sign your name here. And if you're in my class, you should definitely sign your name here. So sign before you leave. We'll be up here. Okay, Andrew, please go ahead. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. I love coming to Georgetown. Uh, I love coming to speak with uh, Professor Brown. And I'm grateful to everybody that turned out in a completely voluntary and uncoerced and even unsuggested way. So thank you guys for taking time out of your Friday uh, to come here. Uh, Professor Brown asked me to speak a while back about, in his words, the question, what do we mean by liberalism? And I was quite surprised by the question, and I think it's fair to say that he was surprised by my surprise. Uh, he was like, what do you mean you can't talk about what do you mean by liberalism? That's what you do. You know, if somebody said, what is Islam? I could give you an answer. So isn't that what you do? I don't understand. Has nobody ever asked you to give a general talk before? And so my hesitation uh, derived, I think, a bit from my sense that liberalism is both a discrete set of political beliefs or attitudes that can be distinguished from others, but it's also, in a way, the water in which we all swim, like modernity itself. But any fully warranted modesty that I had about this talk was related less to the fear that it's impossible for us to step outside the mental frame of liberalism and gain a critical distance. There are a few historical phenomena in the realm of political ideas that have been named and held up for critical scrutiny as much as liberalism has. Indeed, liberalism is itself often identified and defended most earnestly by liberals themselves when they are aware of a world outside of liberalism or what they perceive to be in opposition to liberalism. So rather, my reticence was related to the simple fact that the word liberalism encodes a bewildering range of phenomena. So just to start off in a kind of colloquial way, uh, here are five things, just for starters, that we might ascribe the word liberalism to. First, a very, very macro level historical phenomenon. So sometimes people will say that all of modernity from the 17th century, from the rise of capitalism and the emergence of social contract theory until today is what we mean by liberalism. So liberalism is everything from the uh, fallout of 
the Reformation and the fragmentation of unity of moral value. We're here at Georgetown, so it's obligatory to give a shout out to Catholic declinist theories of modernity, which uh, do attribute to liberalism really everything that's happened since uh, Martin Luther disrupted the, uh, the medieval consensus around moral value uh, and, and moral unity. Uh, but it's very common to say that, you know, liberalism, you know, we live in the liberal age. We live in the world of liberalism, which is characterized by markets, colonialism, uh, uh, a sort of oligarchic democracy. And that's what we mean by liberalism. And that obviously seems very, very difficult to tackle. Alternatively, we might accept a kind of mid-level historical phenomenon. So we might say that, you know, liberalism changes from here to there. But, you know, what we mean is a kind of... Uh, uh, a political project from uh, Roosevelt to Lyndon Johnson, right? That liberalism is the kind of um, mixed economic model that aims to use the state to distribute moderately resources and engage in some kind of social projects uh, to, rem to, to remedy historical inequality and injustice. And what we mean by liberalism is kind of like European social democracy, mixed economic system. That's a mid-level kind of historical phenomenon. Uh, alternatively, we might talk about liberal imperialism. So, uh, you know, in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, Europeans uh, uh, graciously invited themselves to many parts of the world. And there were different kinds of projects. There were illiberal and liberal versions of this. So there's a distinct phenomenon of liberal imperialism that I'm going to speak about in a few minutes. But that's, again, that's a, that's a, that's a kind of historically delineated um, understanding. Or we might talk about uh, the jurisprudence of the Warren Court, right? The jurisprudence that gave us uh, a, a Supreme Court that was willing to uphold racial equality but also sexual privacy and things like that. That is, might be what we mean by liberalism. Uh, and, and importantly about this, this uh, is an attribution that's often independent of what the protagonists themselves say. So we do know that during FDR's time, there was an actual battle over what liberalism meant. So FDR did call himself a liberal. The, uh, the economic classical liberals um, uh, that supported Hoover and so forth said that's not liberalism. Liberalism is free markets. But in many cases, it's not people, you know, John Locke did not call himself a liberal and so forth. Immanuel Kant did not call himself a liberal. So this is a, this is a kind of ex post facto attribution. Third, uh, a little bit different from the last, we might talk about a, very, a relatively specific but historically defined ideological um, uh, uh, sort of uh, apparatus. So we might refer to classical liberalism, the liberalism uh, of Adam Smith and David Hume and so forth that is often associated um, by contemporary libertarians with the true liberalism. Or we might talk about Cold War liberalism, the liberalism of Isaiah Berlin um, and others that uh, was, again, you know, slightly to the left of center, was uh, uh, predominantly preoccupied with responding to communism. This is the liberalism of the old New Republic, uh, the magazine. Fourth, and this might be a bit more interesting for you, I think it's very often common to talk about liberalism as an ethnographic de uh, designation. So if somebody were to say, you know, uh, liberals are the problem today in dealing with uh, racial justice and the demands of Black Lives Matter. So somebody might say, wait a second, I thought liberals were on the right side of that. I thought liberals were the ones, that, you know. But no, what's meant by liberalism is not, you know, what policies you're trying to support, but rather a certain set of observed attitudes, dispositions, habits, revealed preferences, blind spots, uh, or tendencies, not always internally consistent or coherent. It's sort of like, you may have heard that phrase, stuff white people like. You know, when you talk about, uh, you know, a sort of ethnographic, right, I can say, well, you know, this is what people that go to, uh, you know, Harvard are like as opposed to people that go to UMass Amherst. So if you, you say, you know, I can recognize something when I see it, and I want to talk about liberalism as a kind of cultural uh, um, thing that I recognize, right? White liberals that always want to be on the right side but don't actually do anything about it or like certain things but are only willing to act in certain kinds of ways. We sometimes speak about it this way, right? Liberals do this, liberals do that. It's a sort of like... You know, liberalism is what liberalism does, or liberalism is what liberals do, as opposed to, um, you know, a certain, you know, treatise on justice or a, 
uh, or an, uh, an elaborate defense of religious toleration or something like that. So that's another way in which uh, we, you know, we often use the word uh, to talk about white liberalism, is to talk about a kind of historical pattern of attitudes and judgments and dispositions. And then finally, uh, liberalism is a, a philosophy. It is a, there, 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 are, there are relatively coherent, elaborate, philosophical um, uh, elaborations of theories of justice, theories of equality, theories of the boundary between courts and legislatures. Uh, and here, the, what's the difference between this and a historically defined ideology? I would say there's more effort to achieve in internal consistency and to order all of one's values and commitments in a way in which you can defend uh, uh, their consistency. Now, does any uh, does this help us? Right? Does giving this is, these are just five things in which you might you might find the word to be used. Well, I think how do you define something in general? How do you how do you say what conservatism is? How do you say what anything is? Very often you define it by its opposition. And this is how we often define ourselves, right? We define ourselves in terms of our others, what we're not. We understand ourselves largely in terms of understanding our differences between ourselves and other people. So what are the things that liberalism has defined itself as against? Well, I mentioned earlier this thing, early modern liberalism. And here, you know, what makes John Locke a liberal? What makes Hobbes, a very, very ambiguous liberal, possibly not a liberal, but also not somebody that we associate with um, medieval thinking. So liberalism emerged around an opposition to absolute monarchical power. It also emerged around an opposition to various forms of ecclesiastical domination and religious conformity. Uh, but liberalism also emerged historically around um, the opposition to certain traditional medieval economic privileges seen as obstructive of free trade. So you have there, you know, so liberalism tends to be against absolute rule. It tends to be associated with the rule of law or uh, parliamentary governance. It tends to be associated with historical schemes of religious toleration that today don't seem to us very adequate but are historically significant and obviously associated with capitalism. Uh, now, moving ahead, for example, to 18th or 19th century, when we talk about liberal imperialism, uh, what distinguishes that from other kinds of imperialism? Uh, well, liberal imperialism tended to be a kind of colonialism or imperialism that uh, believed in progress, where progress narratives were extremely important, uh, claimed to be improving the lot of others, uh, educating and guarding over colonized others. What is it if you guys... You guys probably don't remember, but that, you know, in, in 2002 and 2003, what distinguished certain kinds of arguments for invading Iraq from others? So we might say that there was the old school kind of realist uh, arguments of Dick Cheney and Kissinger and others, which were unsentimental, uh, completely unvarnished, and very clear that it was about security, our interests, and uh, if some of them might even be glad to admit that, that there was a political economic component. But you may also remember certain kinds of sentimental, disingenuous arguments about democracy, about freeing the Iraqi people, uh, about uh, everybody has a natural uh, a desire for freedom, and that sometimes you just need somebody to break the wheel, as Khaleesi might say. Uh, and so there you go, for your Game of Thrones fans, right? So Daenerys Targaryen is a kind of liberal imperialist, uh, as opposed to the cynical imperialism of everybody else in that show. And let's see what happens to her, by the way. So, so, that's, so when you say liberal imperialism, it's one that says that there's a kind of, you know, so first of all, you believe in progress. You believe that history is moving in a certain direction, which is a core um, attribute of liberalism that has often fallen away in recent years. Um, and that it, that it claims to be governing in the interest of others rather than merely in your own interest. Um, what about 19th century liberalism? So I don't know how good your 19th century history is, but uh, 19th, the 19th century in Europe in particular saw uh, the emergence of a wide variety of ideological configurations, old reaction, right? The counter-revolution to the French Revolution that lasted throughout most of the, of the 19th century, the emergence of socialist movements and communist parties. We're, what, what does it mean to speak about liberalism in the 19th century? Well, liberalism in that sense is defined as an opposition to two things. 
on the one hand, uh, authoritarian state reaction, uh, uh, the, the reaction of the church, the reaction of the nobility, but also not fully being on board with more radical workers' movements and socialist revolutions. So what is a liberal during the 1848 revolutions? It's someone that wants sometimes national liberation from the great uh, you know, multinational empires. Uh, but when push comes to shove, might have to make a decision between do I side with the conservative state forces of reaction or do I side with the incipient socialist parties? And very often liberals were those uh, uh, you know, that, that chose the forces of reaction over the forces of socialist equality. Uh, so again, that's kind of a phenomenological de de definition of liberal. liberal. Liberals are those that acted in this way at different times, had one conception of equality and rule of law, but that was limited by certain other kinds of commitments uh, to property or, or something like that. Uh, and then again, Cold War liberalism. What do you mean by Cold War liberalism? Uh, and so that's largely defined by, by its negative. Look, Cold War liberalism is largely defined by its opposition to what were once called fellow travelers or useful idiots, people that, uh, uh, that were, if not sympathetic to Stalin, at least not anti-communist, did not want to make a politics of anti-communism uh, and uh, against certain kinds of domestic isolationism. And I think in some ways today, there are many, many people that want us to be living in a new form of Cold War liberalism. There are many people that want us to say that to be a liberal is to primarily be opposed to Islamism, primarily be opposed to the, the rise of um, forms of Islamic religiosity. And the true test of a liberal, some of these people whom I'm glad to name if you are interested in keeping a list, uh, once again want, want the test of liberalism to be the test of your willingness to not be a useful idiot for some uh, uh, illiberal ideology. And, and where, what used to be communism is now for them uh, Islamism. But these are still descriptions, and they don't necessarily get at a core set of concepts or commitments without which we might hesitate to call something liberalism. And these historical descriptions don't necessarily help us understand what it means to talk about liberalism or liberal commitments today. Is there anything that unites all of these different ideological configurations? For today's purposes, I actually do want to leave aside the issue of the market, property, and the state, capitalism in general, not because uh, they're not important. Obviously, they are important historically to defining liberalism and perhaps the most important to understanding what has made liberalism a coherent ideology, but simply because I want to focus on a different set of concerns that are both more within my own area of comfort and I think also more germane to the class on Islam in the West. So I want to give you five or six concepts that I think are, they incline towards my philosophical understanding of liberalism, but I don't think they're exclusively in that domain. But I think they're, they're designed to tease apart what I would say is the core of any sort of disposition or ideological or philosophical commitment that, you, that makes sense to use uh, the modifier liberal as opposed to something else. The first is pluralism about the good. Many political philosophies and political movements are organized traditionally around something called the good life. And again, my understanding, and I apologize to anybody that takes umbrage at this, my understanding is that Georgetown is pretty soft on this kind of stuff, right? I think, you know, Georgetown is for people that, you know, aren't quite comfortable with Notre Dame or, you know, you know the Catholic University of America. But sir, I'm sure many of you have been exposed to, uh, you know, there are many, many great Catholic political philosophers and theologians right here. And the hallmark of Catholic political philosophy, for which I have an enormous amount of respect and interest, is this Aristotelian idea that the human good uh, is at the center of all ethical and political reflection, that the human good can be known rationally. Uh, and this is what political philosophy was uh, until maybe the 17th century. Uh, the idea that, human, that, that political philosophy began and ended with the question of what does it mean for human beings to live good lives? Uh, what is human flourishing? And uh, uh, what is good for human beings? And uh, I would venture to say that that is what Islamic political philosophy, and that is what Islamic political thought remains based on, it is based on the idea that there are good choices and bad choices. There are choices 
that are harmonious with human fitra or the human nature, human purpose, and there are choices which are in violation of that. And while Islam and Islamic law, of course, is very, very much a rights-based discourse, it's very much based around rules and distinctions between public and private, it is at the same time at, at heart, it begins with a commitment to a single understanding of what is good for human beings. Now, there is set against that. So I want to say that it might be hard for some of us to say, well, of course, you know, there, you know, what's good for you is not good for me. But it's important to remember that this is historically a very, very recent and in some ways paradoxical foundation for a political philosophy. If you ask the question, can there be reasonable pluralism or disagreement about the good? And this is in many ways also where Greek philosophy began. If you read the Republic, it begins with what is the human good? Or well, it begins with what is justice, but eventually they get around to saying, you know, and, and, and Aristotle as well, of course, right? People disagree. Some people think the good is political life. Some people think the good is pleasure. Some people think the good is honor and military victory. Some people think the good is the life of reason. And very few, with the possible exception of the Epicureans or the skeptics, nobody said, eh, you know, what matters is that we choose our own conception, that we organize political life in a fair way. Every single classical political philosophy was based on the idea that philosophy is only possible if there is a rational and unchanging answer to that question. And if there is not an unchanging answer to that question, then philosophy is not possible. And so, uh, so the idea that there could be disagreement about the good that is grounded in reason itself is a very, very difficult idea, but it is the idea that I would argue is at the core of most forms of liberalism. Can human beings be trusted to judge in their own case? Do human beings know what is good for them? And can a human being's own claim that this is good for me be trusted? These are the kinds of answers that liberalism tends to, uh, questions that liberalism tends to answer in the affirmative. And thus, as a political philosophy, liberalism tends to focus on, not on the single good, but on terms of social cooperation or the terms of justice, or what's sometimes called technically the right. So liberalism tends to, by and large, famously privilege what's known as the right over the good. It's a little bit stylized, it's a little bit privileging Kantian forms of liberalism, but I think by and large it reflects both philosophical articulations, but also probably what most of you people between the ages of 18 and 25 also think about most social life. This is not to confuse liberalism with neutrality. Neutrality is an even more paradoxical concept. Many liberals do endorse a certain public state role in advancing some positive ideas of human flourishing, and liberal political systems are not opposed to all forms of paternalism. You all went to mandatory public education, and you all have to wear seatbelts when you get uh, behind the wheel of a car, or even get into a car at all. But a fairly reliable indicator of what makes a view liberal is this dual notion that A, there might not be one conception of the good that defines flourishing for all humans, and B, adult humans themselves ought to be regarded as, on average, capable of deciding for themselves their own good. Or as Justice Anthony Kennedy notoriously put it in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Two, now, shouldn't freedom be the first thing? Isn't, aren't liberals those that primarily believe in freedom? Isn't liberalism related to liberty? Yes, but I think now we have it reframed a little bit. What is the deep foundation of the notion of this negative freedom, that freedom is the, is the, uh, is the power and the space to choose for yourself? Is it a deep, perhaps Kantian, philosophical commitment to autonomous self-direction? Or is it a recognition that no single conception of the right way to live can survive critical scrutiny? Or is it a consequentialist account of how things seem to go better for human happiness when paternalism and invasiveness is limited? Or is it just skepticism about the powers of reason at all? Is liberalism ultimately based on skepticism that we just don't know what's good? As soon as you think you know what's good, you're willing to enforce it? Or is there some other kind of foundation uh, for a belief in this kind of what's sometimes called negative freedom? Three, equality. 
many recent liberal political philosophers have argued that not freedom but equality is the core liberal commitment. But equality is famously the most complex and disputed concept in political philosophy. We've come a long way from the idea that liberalism is only committed to formal legal equality in political life. This is the view that you might see today most associated with a very, very radical kind of libertarianism, maybe the Koch brothers, and you know that, the, that all, pol all politics promises you is formal equality before the law, and I don't think that most of us associate that view with the center of gravity of philosophical or political liberalism. In the context of American political life, we tend to associate with liberalism, here let me be a little bit skeptical, the bare minimal efforts to move beyond mere formal equality. Your taxes, fortunately, pay for the legal defense of people that are accused of a crime. It's minimal, it's often very, very poor legal defense, but nobody thinks that your right to a fair trial doesn't mean that you have the right to some positive fair value of that. Um, so this is what uh, liberal philosopher John Rawls referred to as a liberal commitment not only to basic liberties, but the fair value of the basic liberties. So this is grounds the liberal opposition to money in politics. This is why even Hillary Clinton disingenuously wants to overturn Citizens United, even though she's the most successful fundraiser in the history of American politics. But if you think that your right to freedom of speech or freedom of political participation is not only formal, but also requires some kind of substantive fair value of that, then you are consistent with a lot of recent liberal political philosophy. Uh, but the question, the deeper question of, with regard to what should we all be equal in society, opportunity, resources, respect, dignity, there's no consensus within liberal political philosophy on what exactly liberalism requires by way of equality or what justifies departures from equality. For the question of the public and the private, liberalism is historically associated with a fairly sharp distinction between the public and the private. The public is the sphere of commerce and formal equality, and the private is the sphere of difference and inequality. You might wonder how somebody couldn't be committed to some of that, but there are what are sometimes known as radical democratic alternatives on the left, for, coming from Rousseau all the way up to certain understandings of what socialism ought to be aiming at, which is that democracy is an attitude towards governing all areas of political life uh, and not just uh, formal rules for how legislatures should operate. But I think that the liberal commitment to the public and the private can be a little bit of a caricature. First of all, liberalism did not invent the public and private divide. Arguably, the most forceful statement of this comes from Aristotle, where the private, right, what does the word economics mean? It means the home. It means the space of the family. The, 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 the home is the space of absolute paternal power, absolute patriarchal power, the power of life and death. The, and, and this is where the, the bare needs of the body, food, clothing, housing are met. And the public is the space, space where certain men who are free from the demands of necessity can go into the public sphere and be political. But not just Aristotle, modern thinkers like Hannah Arendt, who's often regarded as a critic of liberalism, are notoriously uh, uh, in favor of some distinction between the public and the private. Moreover, liberalism in the past decades has, I think, been fully on board with many interventions into the family and private life. Nonetheless, I think it is fair to say two things, that privacy remains a distinctly liberal value. Not all decisions and practices should be subject to constant public scrutiny. And that liberalism remains committed to a certain kind of publicity. So that leads me to my fifth concept, publicity. What kind of public is distinctly liberal? I think there's two things here that are important and distinctly liberal and that perhaps point to both liberalism's strength but also some of its limitations. The idea that power should be justified in public and through public norms and standards of justification I think is a contemporarily distinctly liberal idea. This is opposed to not only secrecy, arguably some liberals debate to what extent there should be secrecy uh, in, in public life, but also to the idea that coercive power does not need to be justified publicly 
in terms that the broadest possible uh, segment of the governed population can accept. And if you see the movement over the past two decades on issues of sexuality, homosexuality, and same-sex marriage, I think the liberal claim would be that what the American system of, of, of um, scrutiny over legislation has done is that judges have had to give public justifications for laws and that the language that was used in the 1980s to justify discriminatory laws against homosexual conduct, if you go back and if you read some of the language in the 1980s, you may be shocked uh, to know that this language was used in the American public sphere by judges, right? Not by Fox News or, or, or alt-right radio that recently. I encourage you to go back and do that and to read what kinds of things were written in magazines like First Things or by the recently departed Phyllis Schlafly were written in the 1980s. You may be shocked to hear the kinds of things that were written about homosexual, homosexuals very, very recently in the American public sphere, but also by judges, also by justices of the, on the American Supreme Court. And I think this idea that increasingly you have to look people in the eye and give them a justification for this, uh, uh, I think on a, on a kind of Whiggish uh, notion, explains why the Supreme Court changed the way that it did. There were very few people that had Antonin Scalia's nerve and willingness to continue to say that it's okay for legislatures to make these kinds of substantive judgments about disgust or matters of, or matters of personal uh, morality or personal distaste. So that, I think, is a distinctly liberal notion, that, that, that laws and power, that there has to be a, a public justification for them that the broadest segment of the population can accept as a justification. Now, what about rights? I think a lot of you, you know, what makes a liberal a liberal? You might say, well, it's commitment to rights or human rights or the Bill of Rights. And that's correct. But hopefully what follows from the preceding is why rights are so central. Where do rights come from? So what, what, what is uh, a summary of the previous points? One, persons are the best representatives of their own interests and good. They have a right to both equal treatment as equals and some substantive claim to equal standing and the fair value of basic liberties. Public power should be limited in scope and in terms of how it can be justified. And now, think about how many of the basic rights and liberties that you might see in uh, you know, the, the UN Convention on Human Rights or the European Convention on Human Rights, how many of that can be derived from those core sorts of ideas? Now, what are some of the perennial problems of liberalism, right? This is a sort of, I think, a fair-minded, I think hopefully positive, but also critical account. Uh, I think there's three big important things that liberalism has historically struggled with. One, or, or, or that are Im Im ambiguous. One is the place of reason. So I think, on, you know, many people from the outside might say, well, the problem with liberals is that, you know, they, they think that reason can solve everything and that, you know, there's a kind of conservative critique that says, uh, you know, that they are willing to tear down anything, tear down the family, tear down mystique, tear down patriotism because reason leads them in direction. Liberals build up from first principles and will go wherever it takes them. I think that's a little bit of a caricature of liberalism. I think that's uh, true of a certain kind of rationalism. But, you know, a lot of the original theorists of liberalism, Kant, Mill to a certain extent, these are also, in many ways, deep critics of, of that kind of reason, right? Uh, and so I think liberalism is also characterized by this kind of um, commitment to and also skepticism about reason. Uh, first of all, this idea about the, the pluralism about the good is derived from a certain kind of modesty about reason. Reason is not ultimately going to lead all human beings to converge on a single conception of virtue or the good life. And there's a lesson there about um, the limits of the place of reason in human life. Uh, uh, at the same time, liberalism is characterized by a certain optimism in the public power of deliberation and reason over the long term. Over the long term, there's a belief that, you know, if you know, again, the homosexuality case, I think, is, 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 is a sort of victory for this kind of liberalism. That over the long term, people realize they don't have any good objections to homosexuality, and their minds will change, right? No issue has been subject to such rapid change in the American public as this issue. 
Uh, but think about how many things haven't. Think about skepticism about climate change. Think about we know what we do in Iraq. We have access to all the knowledge that we could want about the use of weapons in um, Fallujah, and nobody cares. So I think that liberalism you know, it, you know, struggles with this. Are human beings rational? How do human beings care about things that they rationally know? Two, in what conditions can human beings define the good for themselves? So yes, liberals think that human beings ought to be free in this way, but what conditions make this possible? So think about recent debates in France over the Burkini. So you know, I think from an Anglo-American perspective, most of us found this to be particularly ridiculous. I think lots and lots of Americans have a hard time getting inside that French headspace. And I think it's a good irony where I think a lot of people had an easier time sympathizing with Muslim women than they did with the French prime minister. But I think a lot of people said, well, yes, freedom is all well and good, but in what conditions are you actually free? What do you have to be free from? What kind of education do you have to have had? Um, what kinds of uh, freedom from private threats. I think a lot of people do think that Muslim women want to dress this way because ultimately they're scared of what might happen to them in the home or in their neighborhoods or something like that. So there's a deep sense of, yes, I want you to be free, but should you be free from propaganda? Should you be free from Fox News? Is listening to factually distorting information about climate change, about immigration, about the economy, about what Obama is actually doing. Is that consistent with even the kind of negative freedom that we want you to have? That's a hard issue for, um, uh, I think, for liberal. I think it's a genuinely hard question that there's no simple answer to for liberalism. And then another one, which is slightly less obvious, is the question of politics. What is the space of politics and democracy for liberalism as opposed to expertise? And here is also a great paradox of liberalism, that liberals want to say there, other people should not be empowered to decide about the good for others, right? We do not want uh, you know, uh, uh, a French bureaucrat or mayor deciding that he knows better than a Muslim woman what she actually wants, what is actually in her interest. And yet, at the same time, liberalism uh, tends to be a, an ideology of, of uh, educated elite persons and is has a very, very um, ambivalent relationship to democracy. Uh, and so the, the, so the question of, on the one hand, authentically democratic commitments to participation, self-government in that way, argument, persuasion, contestation. Liberals don't oppose those, those sorts of things, but they sit uneasily with another set of values. Uh, again, reason in proper conditions. Uh, deliberation in proper conditions, representation by persons that have the, uh, both the intellect, the education, but also the conditions on which to deliberate about them. So I think, I think the space in which politics, participation, arguing, looking at your fellow citizens face to face, liberals have a, um, have, an, have, have a complicated relationship to that. Many liberals are those that are very, very happy for the Supreme Court to strike down legislation. And there are others, people on the left, that do not want the Supreme Court doing this. They want these things to come about as the result of popular political victories. Now, what are some contemporary policy issues that I think expose, uh, or where either liberalism is um, the scene of a lot of deep moral contestation, or in which the resources of liberalism to answer questions I think is, is, um, is deeply challenged. So one, and I lead with this because of you know, the context of, of uh, the Muslim is Islam in the West class, challenges to liberalism from new religious diversity. So issues around the scope of religious freedom, uh, how to use, speak about you know, uh, Islam in public, um, issues around public expressions of Islamic religiosity, uh, what is expected of religious citizens um, vis-a-vis -vis issues like homosexuality or other sorts of things. Uh, and that's what I think I'm most qualified to speak about. But two, many, many countries in the world, in the West, are facing a new populist backlash. Brexit, in some ways, is a reflection of that. The Trump phenomenon, the Tea Party phenomenon, is a reflection of that. You all know about the rise of right-wing anti-immigrant parties 
throughout Europe. Is liberalism capable of responding to that? What would it mean for there to be a liberal response to those sorts of things? Is liberalism itself responsible for uh, the darker kinds of failures of justice and civility in politics? Is that what liberalism is supposed to do? Uh, or uh, uh, is, is, is that not a fair charge to put at liberalism's doorstop? But if, in fact, uh, we see – we don't need to go full Weimar on this sort of analysis, but I think we do think that Weimar was a failure of liberalism. But you know, to the extent that we don't know how far this right-wing backlash in Europe and the United States can be pushed – and uh, certainly, if you think that liberalism is the governing ideology of modernity, you ought to have something to say about that. Three, does self-government seem possible in this new age of oligarchy and state power? In addition to populist uh, right-wing backlash, we also see, I think, a rise of a certain kind of new authoritarianism in Russia, possibly in the United States, in China. Many Country after country, we see uh, you know, that... Uh, it's not so much populist, fascist-style parties, but a new kind of politics where decisions seem to be made about capital, about military issues, about weaponry, about secrecy, about privacy at a very, very high level, and the emergence of a new kind of style of politics that is distinctly authoritarian, uh, and distinctly oligarchic, and seems to be if, if uh, you know, when, when Professor Brown and I were uh, in college. We see this was the age in which the Berlin Wall had fell and markets were expanding and Clinton was still sunny and the old Clinton, the other one. And, and this seemed to be, well, of course, we're only leading towards more democracy, more human rights, uh, and you know, greater. It's only a matter of time until de democratic waves spread to, to new areas. And I think it's not only the failure of the Arab Spring, although that doesn't help, but I think you know, who today is so confident that that deeper participatory democracy is inevitable in Russia or Brazil or Indonesia. I don't think anybody really thinks that anymore. For technology. So we learned two days ago that Apple is now going to be beaming things directly. You don't even have the, the, the dignity saving device of plugging in your own headphones anymore. So does so so I mean, think about how much of your own lives are spent around my lives. It's not I'm not generation condescending to you, right? Generation shaming uh, is you know is, is a, how much of your own life is determined by technology? How much how much do you think that you can make decisions about how you spend your day that's not already predetermined by the way in which your body and your mind is structured by your relationship to technology? But so is politics and economics, right? So who of us? Things. Who of us has any idea what kinds of employment there will be, what kinds of jobs there will be? Uh, as soon as technology creates a solution and creates a, uh, uh, new kinds of jobs, it takes away the human need for those sorts of things. So is human self-direction at the individual and collective uh, level possible um, uh, given the increasing power of technologies that we have a hard time understanding? And then five, of course, is climate change, right? What is the role of liberalism in both explaining why this has happened to us, markets, uh, the need for increasing quality of life, the need for increasing leisure, uh, those sorts of things, um, uh, in, in, in causing climate change, capitalism, but also what possibly is the role of liberalism in the way that we fantasize about solutions? If we think that democracy is part of the problem, right? D democracies can't make decisions. Democracies are, the more a country is democratic, the more that more people are involved in decisions, the less a group is capable of making long-term decisions at the expense of your short-term interests. So to what extent do our fantasies of salvation from climate change also rest on, I hope experts figure this out. I hope that there are anti-democratic, counter-majoritarian solutions. I hope that there is a technocracy that is able to uh, uh, solve things through uh, 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 technological innovation because I don't have a lot of hope in politics. Is, which is the liberal solution? So a very, very smart guy at uh, Duke Law School, Jedediah Purdy, has recently published a book called After Nature, which I think you should all read. And part of his thing is that, no, politics has to be the solution. 
it has to be a human solution to how we live, how we um, consume, how we organize our lives. And as much as I would love that to be true, uh, I think there's an elite part of me that says, what's the evidence for thinking that people at the collective level have ever done this? The power of fear uh, of what's going to happen to you and your children, the power of resentment and suspicion of other people, well, they're not sacrificing in this way. Uh, those strike me in my pessimistic modes as so powerful that perhaps, you know, I'm really hoping that somebody, you know, does invent this, you know, uh, is it fission or fusion, right? What's the latest thing that, you know, that, that is supposed to, with, with very minimal waste, is supposed to create more energy than the sun. Please hurry up with that. Now, is that, no, no, what's the liberal attitude? Is the liberal attitude that, that puts hope in elites and technology and science or is the liberal attitude the one that, that puts hope in collective self-government? Uh, I'm not sure. So, um, so that's about 50 minutes. Now, uh, I don't know whether this is a good time for questions. I'd also planned to talk a little bit about uh, one issue that I care about, which is this issue of public speech about the prophet and blasphemy and how this points to the limits and tensions of a liberal solution. And I'm, I'm pr happy to go on and do that. Uh, but I'm also happy to sort of see if there's this is a time to uh, open things up to questions. Well, let's see if they have questions. If they don't, then you can add more. All right. This guy does. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm a freshman in the FNS. Unfortunately, I'm not in the class. Uh, I think we're somewhere it's on the West, uh, although I'm really interested in the topics uh, uh, that presu I, I presume to be discussed there. Uh, one of the things I'm most interested in is uh, the tension between uh, democracy mm -hmm. and Islam, especially as it relates to proliferation of illiberal democracies around the world, especially with this you know, sort of conservative backlash, even with, you know, say, Poland now, or can say with Turkey, but uh, specifically referring to the stuff I read, you know, in Shani Khamid's book, uh, work, yeah. and uh, for Zak Zakaria's work about illiberal right. democracy. Uh, can we really say that you know, support from democracy is a liberal concept? Uh, especially because, you know, I remember you know, Richard Young writing about how, in fact, they, you know, for a lot of history, they've been antagonistic concepts. Yes. Or should we rather consider liberalism in a sense, as it relates to democracy, as more of a positional ideology, that it is against, you know, democracy in this epoch, that, it, right. you know, uh, that right. support for democracy is not necessarily at the core of liberalism itself? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. It's a very, very profound question. I think I, I, I am one of those that do think that democracy and liberalism are in tension. I do think that um, they are different sets of values. So your commitment uh, to things like the popular will, self-government, the idea that law flows from the people um, is in tension with other kinds of things, which, is, which are just the kinds of distinctly liberal commitments that I pointed out, that perhaps there should be a limit to public power in uh, private lives that public power should be constrained by a prior commitment to human beings uh, being able to uh, choose their own good, direct themselves in certain kinds of ways, that democracy should be limited by certain kinds of rights and, and those sorts of things. Now, many people don't want this to be true. They want to say there's two ways of doing it. One, which is to say, if you think deeply enough about your democratic commitments, you can derive very, very robust, but not infinitely robust, liberal commitments. So if you say, if you really take democracy seriously, you know that democracy is not just voting. It's not just you elect your rulers and let them do whatever they want, and it's not just um, that whatever the popular will desires at any moment becomes a law. That democracy is about long-term self-governance. It's about the long-term capacity of a people to govern itself, to set its own laws, to secure its interests in the short term and in the long term. And if you think about this, well, what are the conditions of that? Well, you need freedom of association. You need freedom of speech. You need the freedom of uh, persons to organize. You need the freedom of certain kinds of interests to be heard. And so you may, you know, through purely democratic commitments, derive... Um, uh, a, a, a fairly wide set of constraints on mere popular rule. So somebody like the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas is like this, right? He's, he's, he, he, you know, he wants 
the full range of liberal rights and protections, but really wants these to be derived as much as possible from uh, the, the belief in democracy or self-government. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's true that if you do think that democracy is about a reflection of what a group wants, what popular identity uh, uh, demands, then in some cases it is true that the more certain persons are brought into a political system, the broader participation is in politics, the more that certain kinds of popular desires uh, that might be ugly are going to be given a chance in a democratic system. And so for me, the idea of illiberal democracy is not a contradiction in terms, and it's not a, uh, but nor is liberal democracy a contradiction in terms. So then the question that somebody like Shadi Hamid is asking is, what should our attitude be towards illiberal democracy? But a curious feature of that question is, it's what should our attitude be towards somebody else's illiberal democracy? So what should our attitude be towards Egypt or Indonesia? Well, first of all, I don't know. I don't know what, what stake do I have in that. What does it mean to have, a, to have a, a, a critique of that kind of liberal democracy? Is it who we should support as a government? Is it what should we, um, uh, what should we think about it? What kinds of attitudes should we have towards it? So it's not always clear what the stakes of that question are. But I think, you know, I think the question ultimately comes down to um, what reasons do you have for, let's say, being optimistic or having restraint towards an illiberal democracy? And that, I think, is the ambiguity. Is it the idea that all democracies need to go through a period of risk and danger and that in the long run, only victories in the direction of justice that come about from a country's own political development um, are stable and are seen as internally justified over the long period of time. Uh, that's one argument. One argument is, yes, this is very, you know, democracies will do lots of very, very bad things. But in the long run, uh, the only way of a, a um, secure political foundation for justice is one that communities themselves establish. So that's one argument about illiberal democracy. But then the problem with that is, so one, it has this Whiggish quality. It assumes that illiberal democracies will move gradually in a less illiberal direction. And that doesn't appear to be inevitable or true. It depends on a lot of things um, like uh, uh, how power is distributed and what the underlying political views of a society are. Uh, the other argument is that, yeah, illiberal democracies are not great, but ultimately they won't be that bad. So it's not going to be Hitler. It's not even going to be the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's not going to be Berkeley, California, or Cambridge, Massachusetts, but people can still live good and decent lives uh, in societies where they don't have the full range of liberal freedoms. Um, and I think a subtext of that argument is that it's going to be a lot better than what you've had in a lot of countries, which is completely undemocratic oligarchic domination in countries like Egypt or pre-revolutionary Tunisia or Syria or something. And again, that argument has a lot of plausibility, but it, it is ultimately also a question of boundaries. So, you know, it, 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 can somebody live a decent life in which they don't have the right to blaspheme against a prophet publicly? Sure. But what level of intervention in human beings' um, uh, uh, individual expression appears to cross a line between illiberal democracy into something more tyrannical? So that's uh, – I'm not sure if that was your question or if you wanted me to say whether Islam is compatible with democracy. But, yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you fielding the questions or – how about John? Can you deal with that? Islam is a kind of like... He's got to invite me back because I like John <laughs> like here. I would just like to follow up on the democracy. One word that you didn't use yeah. is religion. Yes. Uh, in, for the whole last hour. Yeah. Uh, and yet, when you started the historical thing, liberalism was a lay... Uh, was a lay... 
uh, anti-clerical kind of thing, right. and secularism is an important thing. What can you be? And let, let's uh, I'll shift from can you be a democratic Muslim? Can can you be a liberal religious person? Or right. And and uh, and does it fit into what you were just saying? Is there illiberal religion and liberal religion? Right. Or is religion just simply a construct? I, 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 you've yes. had some arguments about religion as a construct rather than religion as a something. Right, right. So, so what's liberal and religion? Yeah, that's a great question. So if I were back and I were, I were, I were to say, you know, doing this sort of this typology, well, so we sometimes use the word liberal Protestantism, right? So it's usually, usually it's an epithet, right? Very people today continue to call themselves liberal Protestants. But historically speaking, uh, liberal Protestantism is a theological movement that, if I understand it correctly, maybe some people uh, know it better than I do, was associated with 19th century biblical criticism, right? So, okay, we don't, you know, we know that the Bible is a historical, um, is a historical text, and, you know, we as, as Protestants, we're really interested in f philology and getting at, you know, who wrote which kind of book, and, and then also sort of literary criticism, what is the role of metaphor, what, are, what is, you know, different kinds of literary tropes within, within the Bible. And then, of course, you know, as even though Protestantism emerged out of a kind of very Islamic commitment to text and divine sovereignty and the lack of mediation between humans and an all-powerful God, Ultimately, it was, well, you know, we can't, you know, reason has to be a check on our interpretation of Scripture. So we should uh, um, see a lot of things as metaphor. Uh, Immanuel Kant comes right out and says that there is something in the Bible that conflicts with the moral understanding of religion. It must be wrong. So unlike a Schopenhauerian interpretation uh, not Kierkegaardian, not Schopenhauer, interpretation of Abraham and Isaac, Kant comes right and says, that didn't happen. There's no way that Abraham ever would have been willing to sacrifice his innocent son because that's evil. And we can, as Christians, we cannot believe that evil is compatible with religion. And so, and, you know, of course, miracles, well, you know, we don't really believe in miracles. So that's a kind of, you know, Prote you know, that's what we mean by liberal Protestantism. And yet we want to find a kind of moral core to Christianity. And, um, you know, that, if I, my the theological history is correct, hasn't really been very trendy since the 1920s or 30s. But so that's an example, right? What's liberal about that? Well, it, you know, it, again, it has this attitude of, you know, reason is able to trump religion. Uh, authority is something in which human beings are constantly supposed to be engaging with. And there is this skepticism about absolute authority over human selves. Now, w so one view is that religions themselves have to become a certain way internally before they can fully accept democratic practice. And before anybody cared about Islam and democracy, of course, everybody was panicking about Catholicism. And there was a couple of tropes there. One is that internally Catholicism is so authoritarian that Catholics can't develop democratic practices. So this is a kind of, I don't know if it was exactly Tocqueville's argument, but it's that kind of thing, that democracy is about habits of life and habits of the heart and practices and that you learn how to be democrat uh, you learn how to be democratic from various aspects of your life by being a member of the rotary club by bowling together with a lot of people and that by maybe joining a labor union and that in learning how to govern and be governed in turn in various aspects of civil society those areas are both a buffer against the power of the state, but they also teach you how to be a Democrat. And so a lot of people say, well, Catholics can never do this because Catholicism is all about blind obedience to authority. And so, I mean, now I will leave that for other people to say whether that has proved false, that you can be an authoritarian in certain areas of your life. You can believe that you have to submit in areas of faith and areas of practice and in the church. And yet you can separate that 
from other areas of life in which you approach other human beings as free and equal. And so my answer to that in general is I am not dogmatic about that question. And I have a kind of allergy, liberal. huh? You're liberal about maybe? Maybe, yeah, so maybe that is it. Maybe that is a, yeah, a, maybe that is a liberal attitude towards how you treat, you know, so, so, so how you diagnose religious people. Maybe that is, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of allergic to a sort of attitude which proceeds by way of the Aristotelian syllogism, which says something like, you know, if Muslims still believe in Islamic law, even at the level of theory, and have not reinterpreted it to be all metaphor or historical artifact, then it follows that they will never actually be able to do all these other kinds of things. And that is, again, it's an Aristotelian syllogism. It proceeds on the basis of pure reason and not on the basis of some kind of observation and messy interpretation with what actually happens within those kinds of religious communities. So my attitude is um, much more liberal and agnostic about that, which is that it's an open question how the um, you know, ecclesiastical or mosque-based practices actually relate to other kinds of things. And partially it's because persons are not just walking incarnations of their doctrines. Right, So persons may say, yes, I believe this, yes, I believe that, but people have emotions, people have affect, people have experiences, and people are not fully theorized uh, uh, walking um, uh, uh, moral selves. People are constantly living li life through uh, insufficiently theorized ways of reacting to the world, and uh, religion is not an exception to that. By the way, can I just say one more thing? So who disagreed with that is Scalia. So Scalia famously said one of his last things, no. You know, and, and again, I think, it's about, I, th I think it was about the case of the Muslim that wanted to wear a beard in prison. I think that I could be wrong. He said, no, if you're a religious person, you can't pick and choose because religion is fully a, a matter of submitting to the entire thing or nothing at all, which... Okay, well, that's what we've been saying about you for a very long time. Uh, but again, so that's an, so and, and now is so that st also strikes me as a dogmatic statement. It's that religion ought to be this way. It's not a psychological statement. Yes, please. Me, um, your your lecture is really very informative Thank and you. very rich. Um, but I just want to tell you that you brought to mind how Islam was more liberal when the Azhar was taking over in uh, educating and cultivating the people uh -huh. versus when the influx uh, the influx of uh, expatriates from the arab countries or from the islamic nations yeah. to uh, saudi arabia yeah. where it took over the more uh, orthodox or more ex extreme or fundamentalist okay. uh, uh -huh. you know concepts of islam so that's your claim that's what i'm um, uh, it's um, She's finally <laughs> getting clicking. to talk about islam <laughs> yeah, so so because I thought you said that I had said that in my lecture, but I didn't. Yeah, yeah, it's, okay. it's just making me um, compare how it, it, it evolved. So that's very interesting. So uh -huh. let me take a few minutes actually to say that. So how would I, so what would be the liberal response to that sort of thing? Now, El Azhar is many many things. More liberal is not one of them. It's in comparison. I'm not sure. So let's see what's actually going on there. Now, Professor Brown has much more experience there. So there's a couple of things going on. One is the rise of the modern state. And so the classic claim of, uh, of, of uh, Muslims is that up until the 19th century, whatever state there was was relatively weak and that there was a stronger civil society. So insofar as mosques and madrasas survived on the basis of their pious endowments, right, their walk properties. Uh, they, and they had autonomy to govern in certain kinds of areas, in the Sharia courts and in contracts and things like this. Uh, they uh, both were a buttress against certain aspects of executive power. Uh, and they um, were not always corrupted by the demands of the state. Now that's a kind of a, a, a somewhat of a nostalgic view. We all know that the Ottomans are a big exception to that. The Ottoman control over religion and endowments 
and 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 all that goes well before before you know uh, uh, modernity was even an apple I mean a, a twinkle in the eye of Napoleon's code. So so contrary to some people that think that Western colonialism is the source of all the problems, like people like Wael Halak. I actually think that the Ottoman experience makes that much more complicated. John, of course, is the expert on the stirrings of, 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 of this. Um, so what happens? Ottoman Empire falls apart. Muhammad Ali takes over Egypt. Modern states are formed. El Azhar is put under the control of the states. No more independent wealth. Uh, they get their salaries from the state. They're state bureaucrats. Uh, the state has reformed the law. Uh, sometimes there are stirrings to make the law more Islamic in the area of, you know, family law and things like that. Sometimes that pressure comes from El Azhar. Sometimes it comes from Islamist politicians. Sometimes it comes from so-called secular politicians trying to co-opt or, or preempt the Islamists. So El Azhar has this privatized role of giving support to the state, receiving support from the state, and then more or less being able to teach whatever it wants about ritual and private, you know, uh, uh, private religious observance as long as it doesn't raise fundamental concerns about the legitimacy of the state. Now, is that liberal? Some people, critics of liberalism, might say yes. So they might say, that's your liberalism. You talk about liberalism as, or secularism as, separation of religion and politics, or freedom for everybody to, to choose their own. In fact, historically, liberalism is the rise of the central bureaucratic domineering state, and it's about, and it's about um, corralling religion, transforming religion, uh, uh, using religion, and so that's liberalism. And so all of liberalism's claims about neutrality, secularism, separation of religion and state should not be believed. Rather, we should see the state's control over religion as the actual manifestation of what liberalism is. Partially, it's a linguistic dispute. Partially, it's a dispute about um, his historical interpretation. Now, what's El Azhar's role in all this? Now, I suppose it's true that El Azhar wasn't going after people on the streets, except when Farag Foda was assassinated, killed on the street by an Islamist, who defended him? Who defended the killer? An Azhar-trained theologian. So this narrative that El, El Azhar also wants it very much to be the case that we are the moderates. We, you know, they'll even sometimes co-opt this phrase, our moderate Islam. And, and, you know, of course, you have to look at specific issues. It's true that they don't want violent revolution against the state. It's true that they don't want jihadis going and coming back. Uh, it's true that they are not expecting Sharia punishments to be implemented in Egypt pretty soon. Um, and it's true that Salafism and Wahhabism have popularized the, the disputes over religious authority and practice. That gets back to the Patrick, right? Huh? Spencer, sorry. Uh, his question in the back, where, where insofar as democracy is related to things becoming broader and more participatory and more popular, like Protestantism, which was a nasty piece of work at its, at its beginnings, Salafism represents what happens when more people get to participate in this. What happens when people don't just question, don't just obey traditional authority? They set up their own mosques. They say, here's the evidence in, in, in practice, right? Here's the Hadith reports. Let's do this in study circles. Let's do this. And yeah, the state is only legitimate up to a point, and we can bring this out onto the streets. So there, in, in my view, El Azhar and popular Salafism are two different faces of two different kinds of illiberalism. And I would not want to say that El Azhar represents a kind of moderate or, um, or, or, or liberal Islamic interpretation. It represents traditional orthodoxy, which is often very, very happy to put up with all kinds of nastiness in the public sphere. Whether that's to its credit or to its blame is something for everybody to judge for themselves. Yes, sir. Like many others, the whole pathology of negative versus positive. Yeah, readers. okay, I assume people would recognize that, but yeah. I didn't explain are, it. Are there other pathologies that you'd go by that are out there, and how would you define freedom yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. So, 
I don't know if people were from. So uh, Isaiah Berlin, the great Cold War liberal of Oxford, um, wrote a gave a famous lecture in 1950 something called Two Concepts of Liberty." And in many ways, this was a this was the sort of a high statement of Cold War liberalism, and I can explain why. And so he says, "Well, since modernity, there have been these two views. To be free is to." Uh, be master of yourself. It is to have realized your full nature. It is to um, have, have, have conquered not only external impediments, but also your own internal impediments. And so you are free not when you have opportunity, but when you have achieved something. And so Berlin's argument is that sounds nice, but wait till Rousseau gets his hand on it and says that we can force you to be free. And then when the French police can strip women of their burkinis in the name of their own freedom. And then, of course, for Berlin, he wanted to say that this is the heart of the moral dispute between communism and liberalism. And that uh, insofar as communism has a moral idea, not just, you know, a criticism of poverty, but a moral idea, it's that we humans can be masters of ourselves through our production and our overcoming of alienation from one another. But on Berlin's account, this in, invariably turns into tyranny because what it always does is set somebody else up as the guardian of whether you have emancipated yourself or not, right? And that's Right. Not to bang on the French too much, but they do make it easy with this, you know. Right. I mean, you know, to be free is to show your breast to the world because this is what Marianne did. And a free woman does. You know. So so that's it. So, so, so if, if, if you followed any of that French burkini nonsense and you found it really creepy, then Berlin may be your man. And in response, he said, you know, then there are these other heroes of, of, of history. The heroes are people like Hobbes. And to a certain extent, um, Bentham, who didn't always give freedom its due, but they never said, when we take away your freedom, we're making you free. So Hobbes said, yeah, you're not going to have a lot of freedom, but freedom is you doing what you want to do. And for him, there was sort of, he didn't, you know, Berlin was a kind of cold, he wanted a welfare state, he wanted this or that, uh, but his, you know, he, he had this kind of Oxonian aversion to people misusing language. And he said, if somebody is coercing your body and forcing you to do something and calling it freedom, you should mistrust them. And uh, on the other hand, if somebody is taking away your freedom and say, yep, you know, your freedom only goes this far, at least you can argue with them eye to eye. So that's, 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 so we have come to say that, free, that negative freedom is, you know, your own freedom to act and move your body, and positive freedom is your aspiration towards, towards a good life. Now, what do I believe in? Well, let me tell you this. On my computer, there is an app that you should all have that blocks the Internet for as long as you want. And what is it called? And I am not angry at them for calling it that. Right? Whatever part of Berlin still lives within me does not think that they are misusing the word freedom. And so at some level, I do think that there are impediments to doing what we actually want that come from inside as opposed to outside. And there are easy cases and there are hard cases. So the, the easy cases are things that come from our bodily chemistry. So alcoholism, uh, drug addiction. Uh, perhaps, you know, when your brain, you know, goes cuckoo, right? So I think we are, we are increasingly learning the extent to which we are just neurons firing and the extent to which, you know, small changes happen in our brain and big changes happen in our desires and our actions and things like that. Uh, and so I, I have a, so it's much easier to say that um, being free from certain kinds of things internally is freedom. Partially, that rests on one thing, which is that we really do see these things as alien to us, right? We really do see these things as um, kind of colonizing our body, right? If you have an illness, you feel that you are at war with yourself or something in you is at war with you. And I think, you know, things that are related to distorting your mind are, are of that nature and the internet is definitely one of them. 
Uh, and so, not about porn, or not, it's not about what you're doing. You could be doing absolutely nothing, but you have to be doing it. That's the, you know, the compulsion. And so, uh, and, and, but what, what also is doing the work is that you think that, you know, no great human interest of mine is being taken away when my freedom to act in this area is taken away. So if you are permanently deprived of internet access, yeah, you might say, well, now I can't, I can't live as a person in this world, and I can't seek information, and I can't pay my bills, and I, uh, you know, I can't send cat videos to my mom. But uh, what gets harder is when you say that I feel that there are these um, desires that are colonizing me that make me act in different ways, but in which perhaps very, very profound human interests might be at stake. Uh, sexual interests, right? So, you know, there are many people that feel alien from their sexual desires. You know, people that have grown up in homophobic communities and, and sort of feel alien from that. And there I would say I'm much more cautious about using the language of positive, that, that, that to be free is to be free from these kinds of sexual desires. But that's because I think that there is nothing wrong with those desires and that, um, and that sexual expression is a deeply important aspect of human life, unlike fidgeting with your phone every 10 seconds. So what I so I'm not going to give you the true answer, but I will say that I think that that has to remain a a crucial philosophical area of investigation, which is figuring out. Um, so so I am not a liberal that thinks that exploration of what human flourishing is and what the good life is is a nonsensical or meaningless question, right? I think it remains the most important question. While there will be many answers, I think that the language of important human interests and less important human interests is a if not the core aspect of ethics and uh and 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 then not only identifying those interests but identifying the conditions in which we feel that we can act on our highest order interests um is a core aspect of of how we ought to structure our ability to to live in the world An agonistic liberal you know, indicates something slightly different. And agonism is sometimes taken to mean that you really like politics, right? You really like people, you know, like, so an agonistic liberal might say something like, um, excuse me, in the Burkini dispute, I don't want the courts to overrule it. I want there to be a robust public debate about this sort of thing. And I want this to really to be emerge out of politics. And I don't know if I think that about everything, right? I don't, I, I, I don't think the conditions, like a lot of people really wanted to debate the burkini or women's dress in general in France. And a part of me says that's good. A part of me says that's part of the philosophical life and that people should be exploring issues of uh, gender and gender expression and freedom and coercion and, uh, and all of that. But part of me says, in many cases, the conditions for doing that are going to be so bad, and people are going to be doing it in such bad faith, and people are going to be entering it already with such certain knowledge of what other people ought to be doing that the likelihood of this um, coming out with anything good is, is very small. And again, that's part of the, I think, the, the, the weaknesses or the ambiguities of liberalism, right? Is that, you know, liberals want there to be dialogue and discussion but then sometimes they're afraid of what the outcomes of this sort of might, might, might be. And sometimes you want to just say, no, that's the function of rights, is to say the, the French Conseil d'État said these women are not a security threat. They're not engaging in political disruption. So, halas, there's no grounds for this law. And part of us said, well, sometimes, yes, we shouldn't be engaging in, you know, the, the best thing that happened when people stopped writing op-eds about the burkini. So I'm of, I'm of multiple minds about that. I think the uh, concept of would be very interested in the music of Arabic. Uh, yes, the, yes, right, exactly. <laughs> yes, <laughs> try, try thinking of it more as fashion than philosophy. Fa well, that's the, actually, that's part of the problem, is that then, you, of course, the French are all too happy to say, I'm offended uh, uh, about this on, on aesthetic grounds. To be French is to have a modicum of good taste. And, and, you know, and, and so, you know, a lot of people, you know, they're, they're shameless the way they will talk about these sorts of things, right? Uh, Yes. <laughs> so, hang, hang on. How much time? I forgot what time this is. 1.30? 1.15. 1.30. Okay. So, someone said 1.15. I think Kristen said 1.30, but, you know. Uh, 
Uh, uh, well, we can have, let's say, one more quick question, quick answer, and then we'll go. Okay, along the lines of the previous question, kind of the ideas like discourse and like public debate, I was wondering which like, liberalism your thoughts are on kind of um, certain like types of discourse, like discourses about race or about gender, yeah. in certain communities that are like not necessarily insular, but that are like um, involved in discussing about what is, what is to be done about race or gender in those communities, and whether or not the public at large, yeah. or liberals at large, um, do they have a say in that dis in that discourse? Are they allowed to like to participate, or is participating there somehow against um, what you said earlier about the pluralism of, about the good? Or mm -hmm. do they have some kind of say in the good right. um, that these communities are trying to reach? So that's a really really rich question. That's outstanding. So I and and, and the problem is that all of those communities are different. So so let's take uh, you know uh, debates about uh, race in this country, Black Lives Matter, which maybe hope against hope appear to have um, appear to have uh, uh, broken through a kind of barrier in public consciousness so that it has to keep on happening over and over. And what I observe is a number of different sorts of things. One, which is that, so one argument goes that we as African Americans or people that um, uh, are committed to a certain kind of racial justice, a core aspect of our politics is not just pushing for laws and pushing for things like that, but about problematizing white consciousness, right? So when I said stuff white people like that was kind of a joke, but it kind of wasn't. It was like, you know, this idea that whiteness is now supposed to be a political topic, white privilege, white this. So many people say that's an extraordinary political accomplishment. And uh, I think that's right. And I think the way in which non-white comedians, non-white media, social media, the way in which getting white people to see themselves as white, but in a different way that they have wanted to see themselves as white, is an extraordinary political accomplishment. One which white people will keep on pushing back against as long as they possibly can. And so that's one view, and so that's one view, so that, that, that the discourse should be as public as possible, but it should be as public as possible, and insofar as it only represents a white kind of public, it's not representative and it's not public. Then there's this other view, which you sometimes hear, which you say, which is goes like, I am sick of talking to white people about race and I'm no longer going to do it, right? And to which there's this burden, you know, that I constantly have to, I'm, I'm sick of explaining to you and persuading you that there's a problem. And, I, and it, the burden is always on me. I always have to do it. And then even if, I'm, if I succeed, all I succeed is getting you to be pleased with yourself that you're now woke, okay? And I think, of course, Muslims in this context have a similar sort of thing, which is, you know, uh, how many times, and I'm, I'm, I'm neither non-white nor am I a Muslim, but how many times have Muslims experienced after 9-11 you know, oh, your English is great. Oh, you know, you're one of the good ones. Oh, you're a credit to your, oh, oh, if more people like you would speak up. And then there's, you, you, some, you talk, here, like, even people that are, do not identify with Islam, are not particularly religious, do not identify with, let's say, Muslim identity politics, will say, I am sick of doing this, and I am not doing this anymore, and I'm not going to accept praise for not being a terrorist, and I'm not going to accept, and I'm not going to answer, and it's not your fault. Maybe it's the first time you asked me about my religion, but it's not the first time I've gotten that question. And in 2016, I'm no longer going to do this. My role in the public sphere is not to constantly make sure that you are as comfortable as possible all the friggin' time, okay? So, and these are just things that I hear, obviously you can see what I look like, uh, secondhand, okay? So I'm sure many of you could put this in much more powerful and eloquent terms than I could. But what's the question? Why are you asking me this question? So this judgment about what is public, what is not public, how to make things public, when should things be made public, and to what extent changing public speech, changing public attitudes is the most urgent political um, task. So I would just say this gets back to Jack's agonism, is that there's no single right decision to that, or maybe to be less agonistic about it and more Aristotelian. Right? Again, I always come to Georgetown and want to talk about Catholics and Aristotle, and you guys may feel completely othered by this and completely stigmatized, right? So we just come here because it's a great school. But uh, so, what is the, so Aristotelian ethics is, is much less about getting the right answer in advance and judgment 
in situ, right? Phronesis, practical wisdom. So being an ethical, being a practically wise person is knowing when to do the right thing based on a variety of things in your own self-control and virtue and those sorts of things. And so there's a lot, you know, that may be the best answer you can say is that persons living in the world have to make decisions about what politics calls for, what's possible, and what they themselves can bear, right? Some people have more patience than others. Some people have more grace and indulgence towards other people's misery than others. The other side of your question is, to what extent should the public sphere then be interfering in other people's discourses? And that's also not easy. So, you know, to what extent should how women dress, if you're Muslim, be an issue of public concern? Or is that an issue only for the Muslim community? And of course, I immediately have a completely different reaction to some non-Muslim saying the burkini is a manifestation of, of, of patriarchy and domination and hatred of women to then a Muslim woman who says, yeah, we should actually talk about veiling and the burkini and, 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 and misogyny and um, what modesty actually means. And so am I just being a hypocritical liberal? We're saying, you know, you can't talk about that, but you can. But there's a truth to that. There is a truth to the stakes that you have in something, your good faith, your investment in something, and your right to pronounce upon what are very often difficult private matters of judgment. Now, I don't think that that is always the case. So my book that, that only uh, Professor Brown seems to like is, is uh, a, a, a proceeds from this concept developed by uh, the philosopher John Rawls called conjecture. So he says in, there's, the default is public reason. So we all say if we have a common matter, you know, should same-sex marriage be legal? Should the burkini be legal? Whatever. That we should all argue with one another on the basis of values that we can share, right? So if Catholics or others can't defend only heterosexual marriage um, uh, uh, um, on grounds that other people could accept, you have to give that up, okay? But then Rawls said, well, there's other kinds of non-public discourse. Sometimes religious people will feel the need to bear witness, okay? That I don't expect you all to do this, or I, I'm not giving you, but I, I want to bear witness that I, as an evangelical pro, uh, Protestant, cannot abide by torture because as a Christian who constantly thinks about Jesus being tortured, I have, an, I, have a, I have a perspective on the body that has to be brought public. Now, that, that person's not saying, because I have this relationship to Jesus being tortured, that we should ban torture. It's, it's, it's bearing witness, okay? And then he also said there's this thing called conjecture, which said that we can sometimes go into other people's doctrines and say, I'm not a Catholic, but I've read some Aquinas, and I think that you, Robbie George and Ryan Anderson and other people, are actually wrong about what marriage is. It's not a sacrament. It's not conjugal creation of a new soul. It's just sex for creating babies, and it's a civic thing. That's what Aquinas says, right? Aquinas does not think that marriage is what you think it is. So if I say, I'm not a Catholic, but I think you've got, I don't think that you have to argue this way. So Rawls called that conjecture. And so my book was based on this idea that, well, can I, as a non-Muslim, look into Islamic law and make a certain case for this? Now, I wrote that book. I started that book in 2002 or three. I'm not sure I would do that today. I'm not sure I would do that today. In fact, I'm not doing that today. And partially it's because, you know, in this public uh, uh, setting, you know, in fact, in many ways, things are so much worse than they were right after 9-11, you know? So much worse, I, I think, in terms of the public pressure on Muslims. And this idea that Islam must constantly be told that it's reforming, Muslims constantly uh, asked to bear witness that they denounce this, they denounce that. And so while I do not denounce my own book, I, uh, and, and I think that you can make a distinction between doing things the right way, doing things the wrong way, doing things in a respectful way, doing things in a modest way, uh, when do you do it in public, how do you do it in public, uh, I think it's increasingly hard to separate that, and I am increasingly uh, uh, sympathetic to the mistrust that a lot of Muslims might have. Here's just another non-Muslim white guy that wants to say how Islam can be different. Now, I don't know if that's a true statement. I'm increasingly sympathetic 
to that sort of uh, to that sort of attitude. So, uh, so I think you know this this what is public and what is private is not fixed, right? It's not fixed once and for all. Hannah, Hannah Arendt said some very silly things about the public and the private. Uh, I think it's constantly subject to contestation, political contestation. Uh, sometimes that contestation is good and healthy politically. Sometimes it's bad. And I think that's what being a mature, ethically informed, politically minded citizen is, is trying to make a judgment in a case-by-case -case basis of what is actually going on here. Do I like it? And for, for, you know, what are political reasons and what are ethical reasons? Okay. Andrew, that's a lot of mental meat. Mental meat, right. Uh, Great. I, Thank got, you. I think I got Thank most you. of my students come up and check with me to make sure I got you. Uh, thanks very much, Andrew. Thank you. We'll have to definitely bring you back. Yep. Thanks, guys.